Uh, hi, welcome everyone. Um, this is fun. Thank you for being here. Um, this is uh, this is the Science Party uh, Education Policy Focus uh, meeting and information gathering session. Uh, hopefully we can have some uh, interesting discussion, uh, input into our education policy thoughts, brainstorms, ideas, you know, that sort of thing. Um, it's pretty cool to have uh, some experts here, experts in education who know what they're doing and they, they do what they do very well, come and talk to us about our policy. Uh, we're proud of our policies and uh, we, we really like it when we get expert input from other people and that's what these guys are here for. Uh, so today that's going to speak to us, we've got Catherine Walsh uh, who is representing Fairness in Religion in Schools, um, all about special religious education. Vachi Ansurian who is the uh, Vice President of the Science Teachers Association of New South Wales and Simon Crook, Dr Crook, recently knighted, no that, that, that's not the right word is it? <laughs> recently something graduated, graduated. <laughs> thank you um, uh, oh, I didn't even know what to call you expert of course education consultant, consultant uh, has his own company called crooked science where he goes into high schools and primary schools and talks to students and teachers about science education now these guys will give a quick intro into what their perspective of education is uh, essentially how they can help us and how we can help them uh, from their perspective and from the Science Party perspective. Uh, I guess it's open to them, but I guess ask them any questions at any time. After each of them has had their say, I think we should ask a couple of questions and then at the end, a bit of an open discussion about some of the things that set, they've said, questions we have, questions you have, things to go on, you know, etc. That's enough from me. Uh, I'm going to hand over to Catherine. Thank you. <coughs> Hi, um, my name is Catherine Walsh. I'm an English and drama teacher. I have three children. Uh, they were in a, a public primary school and now they're in three separate public high schools. Um, I currently work at the University of Sydney in the Faculty of Science in an administrative role, supporting curriculum re review. So my, I'm still working in education, just in a different way. Um, I still tutor in English. I'm involved with other English teachers and uh, getting our heads around the new syllabus and all that kind of stuff. Uh, the school that my, the primary school my children went to was a bit of a hub for evangelical Christians and that made me um, investigate the policy quite thoroughly, ask lots of questions of the Department of Education, um, engage with the principal at the school <coughs> and the church as well, and then other schools in our community because I found that the, the, the <coughs> situation in my children's school was not unique. Um, I, was in, I was interested in fairness and religion in schools when I heard that they about their victory in Victoria. So they were a group that started because of the, um, the aggressiveness of evangelical Christians in delivering scripture in schools in Victoria. And under a Labor government, after they'd changed it to an opt-out, uh, an opt-in rather than opt-out in terms of enrolment, and they had much more transparency about what was being taught, the whole thing fell apart and it's, it's no longer embedded in the school day. So there are lots of ways to approach the issue. The, the way that I'm going to approach it today is purely structural. So I'm not going to argue about, you know, <coughs> whether you have the right to believe whatever you want. This is purely structural. So, scripture in schools. Public schools are a model for what a functioning society can be. They aim to be inclusive, to be respectful of all students and to cater for everyone's needs and encourage everyone to get along together, with one exception. Public schools have policies that help create inclusive learning communities. These policies include ones about not bullying, about the values in public education, and one that states that any employed teacher or visitor to a public school cannot try to recruit students into partisan groups. 
Schools aim to be <coughs> neutral spaces. Teachers are to try to deliver the curriculum objectively and to facilitate activities that help students to make up their own minds about what they believe and who they support. This policy is called the controversial issues in schools policy and it is suspended so that a program can be run in public schools. And that program is the Special Religious Education Program. So while we may argue about whether the program of Special Religious Education is educational, and we've got more information about that since the re report of the reviews come out, I'll talk about that in a minute, we must acknowledge that SRE is special. The groups that deliver SRE are called authorised providers. They become authorised by submitting an application to the New South Wales Minister for Education via the New South Wales Department of Education. <coughs> Prior to their application being sent to the Minister, these applications are reviewed by the Department's SRE Consultative Committee. Now this committee is made up of representatives of the current providers and evangelical Christians are overrepresented in that group. Um, on our website, you can see who's, who's on that committee. Um, and I've marked, I, I do the website for our group, I've marked uh, which of these people are evangelical Christians. Even the people representing Catholicism are evangelical, which is rare, and the people representing the Uniting Church are evangelical. That's how they identify. If you Google their names, that's how they will present themselves. Um, so there are also in that group are four employees of the department, so two, two who are administrators in the department. There's the principal, uh, the, the leader of the um, Primary Principals Association and the leader of the Secondary Principals Association. They're not, none of those people are allowed to criticise the policy because it's the policy of their employer and they have a code of conduct. So that's just standard as a code of conduct. Uh, and there are two other positions, a PNC rep. Now, in, up until last year, that PNC rep was also an evangelical Christian. The, um, the, if, you, if you look closely at how evangelical Christians talk to each other about scripture in schools, they encourage you to be on the PNC executive. Um, and now there's a new position, a vacancy, hasn't been filled yet, for Teachers Federation representative. So the group, this group, the Consultative Committee, they direct the department on the interpretation and the implementation of the SRE policy. And they wrote the terms of reference for the review that's um, just been, um, the report's just been released on that review. The authorised providers are supposed to have a website with their curriculum available so that parents can see what they are agreeing to because consent is not consent unless it's informed consent. Many providers don't have a curriculum on their website. So at, um, the people of Ferris did, a, did a, um, an audit of all the providers as listed by the department. Um, a number of them didn't have a website. The link provided was broken. We couldn't find a website. Um, I think there were maybe a hundred and, I can't remember if, remember if it was 104 or 107 providers, but more than 60 of them didn't have a curriculum. Uh, one of them had a Facebook page. Three of those linked to groups outside New South Wales. So it, was, it, it wasn't instructive for parents to be able to try and find the curriculum by going to the website. So, so um, now we know that the department knows that lots of providers don't have curriculum on the website. The providers create and authorise their own curriculum. The Department of Education doesn't see it and has no say about its content. So according to legislation, they cannot ban anything in it. Remember a few years ago, some books were banned and then they were unbanned? They were unbanned on the basis that the department has no say in what's delivered in SRE. Um, the regular curriculum, the Australian curriculum, which includes the general capabilities of critical and creative thinking, intercultural understanding and ethical understanding, does not apply during the SRE time slot. The authorised providers accredit their own instructors 
and the authorised the, the department asked that each year they make a submission to declare that their volunteers or paid instructors comply with child protection procedures. So they just sign a form to say, yes, they do. So schools, principals, have no authority to discipline SRE instructors. And in this way, also, SRE is special. To complicate matters, religious groups form combined arrangements to deliver SRE. Now, these groups themselves are not authorised providers. They're supposed to be using people who are authorised by providers, but it makes it very difficult to work out who's authorised to do what. And um, Ferris has kind of tried to unpick some of these arrangements at various schools and then gone to the principal and said, you, you're using people who are not authorised providers. And then we, it's up to the principal what happens then. And we've also told the department about that and the department just sort of shrugs. The current policy is unfair to school principals. Under the policy, any authorised provider who approaches the school to deliver SRE must be accommodated. That means that principals need to change their timetables to schedule SRE in. It must be accommodated. And it has to be at the convenience of the providers. Now, the providers don't want it to run at the end of the school day because they think that students who aren't going to be in the program will just leave, and that's more attractive to students. So it has to be embedded in the school day. Under the policy, parents have the right to complain to the principal. The principal is given all responsibility but no authority. Normally, principals would have some authority about what programs can be run in their schools. And again, in this way, SRE is special. Now, there are people who say, if you don't want to participate, you can just opt out. Now, we know that a lot of students are um, who should, have, should be opted out aren't because of the design of the enrolment form means that people, ch students, children, are funneled into this program when they don't expect to be. But when, when you're talking about opting in or opting out, what you're really talking about is how many students are you prepared to discriminate against? Under the policy, any student who opts out is to be given no educational instruction during the SRE time slot. This is at schools. So clearly that's discrimination. The core business of schools is teaching and learning, a policy that states a group of students are not to be taught based on the religious belief of their parents is discrimination. And to, to, to to exclude any student, group of students from teaching and learning during the school day is discrimination. In many schools, the participation rate of SRE is very low, uh, particularly in high schools. It's not uncommon for there to be about a dozen students in SRE while hundreds or maybe a thousand students are not in SRE and are not to be given any, in any educational instruction in that time slot. So we don't, but we don't know exactly how many students because the Department of Education does not collect and publish data. And again, in this way, SRE is special. So this is the analogy that I like to use. Imagine if this policy applied in hospitals. So we know hospitals have regulations, procedures, policies. The staff there are qualified professionals. Imagine if hospitals ran a program which meant that from 10 a.m. to 10.45 every Wednesday, their staff take a break and the volunteers come in to take care of the patients. The patients have the choice of opting out of the program, but they can receive no care during that time slot. And this is done because the volunteers want to do it. This is exactly what's happening in public schools now. So what we want at Ferris is for the curriculum and the policies of public schools to be consistent throughout every school day. And I don't think that's too much to ask for. So that we can solve this in either of two ways. We can just change the legislation to remove SRE from public schools and give that time back to professional educators. Or we can do what we're doing now. <laughs> inform parents 
ask that parents act as policy enforcers in their schools, in their children's schools. Uh, we can increase that by doing that. We know that we're increasing the administrative burden on principals uh, by asking, well, ensuring that they follow the SRE policy to the letter. Because in most schools that we know of, there are currently breaches in policy. Uh, we can ensure that parental consent is informed consent, and we can we can aim to change the membership of the consultative committee. We can see groups calling themselves Wiccans or Satanists apply to be providers of SRE. We can make it an election issue. We can write plays about it and sing songs about it and watch it all fall apart and then change the legislation. I know which way I'd prefer. <laughs> so when the, when the report came out a few weeks ago, there were some sensible things that we would have liked the department to have supported, which they didn't support. One was collecting data, they're not doing that. One was to make it opt-in, they're not doing that. Another was that at high school, students who are not in the program can do their own, can receive educational instruction. That's not supported by the department. Another was that high schools wanted to be able to opt in or out of the program as a school. So the principal would have the right to say, we're just not running this. That recommendation was not supported. What was supported, that the, the, the providers learn what education is. So this is, the, this is the list of what was supported. This is on the department's website. So they, they've been asked to find out from educational experts what is meant by the term curriculum outline, what is meant by curriculum scope and sequence, what is meant by effective pedagogies? What is meant by relevant learning experiences? And what is meant by the term age-appropriate learning experiences? They've also been asked to learn how to use an interactive whiteboard and a digital projector. So what all this shows is that even though this has been in schools since the late 1880s, the way that it's run is a failure. The, the responsibility for improving it has been given to the consultative committee itself. So the representatives of the providers who say that this is education have been told that they need to learn what education is. Now the problem with this, well there are a number of problems. <laughs> One of the problems is once they realise what education is, I think it should be very clear to them that they have no place in a school because they're not interested in education. They're not mapping things in terms of critical thinking or um, aligning with anything in the Australian curriculum, the, um, the general capabilities or the cross-curriculum focus or, or anything like that. Their learning outcome is conversion. Really, if you look at what they... Uh, if you look at all their promotional um, videos and the way they speak to each other in trying to recruit scripture teachers and supporting scripture in schools, that's their, that's their end game. Um, another thing is, we know who knows about education, that's teachers. And we know where to find teachers, that's schools. So this is the state of, um, this is the state of scripture in schools at the moment. Uh, the, the, the way that the department just shrugs at a whole lot of issues here means that the, the human rights of, of teachers and of parents and students are being breached. And it also means that the Department of Education is not taking its duty of care to students seriously because they expose they expose students. Well they just find, they're allowing access to um, these authorised providers who are not educators and are not interested in education and at the same time discriminating against huge numbers of students. Okay, that's me. <laughs> Does anyone have like a single question for Catherine before we move on to Bachi? Oh, yeah, it comes to the 
duration that can be allocated to? Yes, there's caps, yes. So it's between half an hour and an hour per week. So it's limited to um, uh, 10 hours a term. Mostly it's run on a weekly basis, but some schools mix it up so it might be one stage this, it's different in high schools and primary schools, it might be one stage at this, this week and another stage the other week, depending on how many volunteers are available and um, how the school is prepared to run it. But it's mostly based on um, the availability of the volunteers to run it. And are there any wicked groups? Or <laughs> no, well, I can tell you about Reverend Dan of the Church of the Flying Spaghetti Monster, the Gordon <laughs> Church of the Flying Spaghetti Monster. He did applied to... Here did week. you? Excellent. <laughs> um, so uh, Reverend Dan works, is involved with us. We speak to him. He put in an application to be an authorised provider. His application was knocked back on the basis that, one, he couldn't prove his faith in a supernatural being, <laughs> and two, he couldn't, he didn't have the curriculum on a website. Now, the application form didn't ask for a curriculum or a website, and we know that more than half the providers don't have a curriculum on a website. Website. So really, it's a farce. Just but we also know that the consultative committee is afraid of more providers of that type applying because they know they can't keep knocking them back forever. Does mm. that non-belief in a supernatural being test preclude non-theistic religious providers like Buddhists? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so we, we, you know, he appealed, you know, Buddh Buddhism is a scripture in schools, runs scripture in right. schools. They don't. It, it doesn't make any sense. It was an excuse. Do they offer mythology, like Greek or Norse no. mythology? No, I've got, actually, I've got a, um, I wrote my master's in rewriting mythology, Greek, uh, yeah, classical mythology. No, they don't. But there's an opening there. <laughs> if you want to do ancient polytheism, go for it. And <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 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 um, I think we move on to Vachin now and there's plenty more there. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Vachian Suryan. I'm currently the Vice President for Stanswell, which is the Science Teachers Association for New South Wales. The association itself has had quite a rich history across the years and its sole purpose is that professional body for all science teachers in New South Wales to provide for professional learning and to provide for an exchange of ideas for teaching strategies and resources, which is something that Stanswell has done for a long time. Stanza also has um, a lot of, um, we wouldn't call them side projects, but a lot of um, other activities as well that have been part of its rich history, something like Young Scientist, which is um, a competition every year that is run, which involves students across New South Wales, that has seen a lot of our students in our schools across all sectors reach international acclaim in terms of what they've done. So we've sent what we call our scientists, our students, overseas to things like um, ISEF, which have been overseas competitions, um, BHB at Bilton, and in the recent years, things like Google Awards as well. So they've been, it, it, it's a quite a rich organisation in terms of what it does for teachers. So essentially I'm here representing Stanswell, representing the President as well as all our members that we have across New South Wales. In terms of where Stanswell sits, Stanswell believes that teachers work across all areas and teachers work across all sectors. So the Catholic sector, the independent sector, schools that don't belong to any as well as departmental schools all come together within teacher association organisations to be able to give um, pro professional learning, to be able to share resources and that's always been quite rich and we've had things like conferences across chemistry, physics, earth and environmental biology, senior science, all the courses that we have from kindergarten all the way to year 11 and 12 that we support all our teachers in. I think first and foremost what that means when it comes to um, looking, at science pol uh, looking at science policy, dissecting science policy and what that looks like in terms of the, the greater public is that it has to look at education at its very core and what does that mean? And that means education for all students, across all sectors, across all beliefs, across all organisations to be able to provide the best quality of teaching for them. And that best quality of teaching not only comes from experience and expertise within the classroom but from a rich professional 
professional learning culture, which is something that's been going on for quite a while. And one of the biggest things these days that we, we tend not to see is a push for more professional learning that's aimed at not fulfilling teachers with content. And we are science teachers, we love our content, we walk into the classroom, that's what we do. We're walking Google and Wikipedia to all our children and all the students that we teach. But essentially what we need and what teachers need across the state is professional learning for pedagogy, for strategies, to be able to help implement the syllabuses and the curriculums that we're teaching. And that includes a science and technology syllabus, K-6, to which is an integrated syllabus in the primary streams, as well as science 7 to 10, and the year 11 and 12 science courses, which is across biology, chemistry, earth environmental science, invest senior science, and physics, and including science life skills that we see across all the stages. What's happening now when talking about the changes in science education is year 11 and 12 is changing its syllabus courses which will be implemented next year. So we're seeing a change to subjects like senior science which is a general science course for all students to a subject called investigating science that's a really more open-ended, really rich context driven where there is no content. Essentially we can engage our kids in the science, bring in the content from all areas and it's something that a fair few teachers are quite excited about because it does what we do best and that's teaching. And the great thing about all these new courses is that what we've done as, um, as educators and what um, the Board of Studies now known as NESA has done is have brought in what we like to call science. Not that kind of wishy-washy that, uh, that has kind of been around for the past few years. Essentially we're teaching really rigorous content now. Physics sees a return back to um, content like thermodynamics which is integral to what physics is which has been out of the syllabus for the past 18 years. We have a return back to mathematical formulas in chemistry and physics where we've seen a bit of a decline previously as to that. So a few changes now and the reason why I mention these changes is because essentially what Stanza wants to see and what we want to see across all schools whether you're a member or not is rich professional learning and rich development for all teachers. And when it comes to education policy it's quite important to be able to support the teachers first and foremost in terms of their professional learning and how they teach pedagogy, how they utilise pedagogy, how they utilise strategies in classrooms, how they blend in that content for their students to engage them, as well as supporting our students with a really rich syllabus and a really rich curriculum. And currently as it stands, we're seeing that in the next change with Year 11 and 12, and we've seen that with the introduction of the Australian Curriculum Integration in New South Wales, whereby, just as a note, New South Wales follows its own syllabus, its made syllabus that it takes from the Australian curriculum. So all the Australian curriculum priorities and cross-curricular priorities have been now embedded into the New South Wales curriculum for 7 to 10, for K to 6 and Year 11 and 12, as well as some other priorities as well that are really rich, like diversity, things like work and enterprise, which lead into things that we all love, like STEM, which has been a really big thing now as well. This leads me, which is a nice little segue to talk about STEM and how that fits within education. Schools across all sectors have seen STEM as being quite important and that's been a push with the government with the national STEM strategy that was released 2015 in December. Essentially with the STEM strategy the idea behind that was to support teachers in what they're doing with STEM and to help students see the importance of STEM careers. And we talk about STEM sometimes, so it's, we like to get lost in the fact that STEM is science. But STEM is science, technology, entering and mathematics combined. But when we see that in schools we see that where it's a applicable. Teachers are blending STEM into their learning, not as everything all in one. It's really difficult to be able to take one concept or one topic and tie in technology, engineering, mathematics and science, even if it doesn't fit. And that's not authentic learning. Authentic learning is where it fits best. And schools across all sectors are bringing STEM education to their schools, whether it be as subjects that students can engage in or whether it be within their own subjects. And a lot of science teachers are bringing in STEM lessons where they integrate a little bit more of the mathematics, a little bit more of the engineering and technology. And as a science teacher, if you're not teaching physics, mathematics can be quite a burden because we do science, we do mathematics a science way, which is very different, but essentially it's all the same. A graph in math looks very different from a graph in science, apparently. And that's what we want to see. We want to see that really rich building of professional learning in schools. And that STEM is really important. But what we also want to see is STEM not being the the main focus or a compulsory subject or having STEM teachers because that's, that's not what we do as teachers in New South Wales. In New South Wales we are subject specific experts when it comes to stage 4, 5 and 6 which is 7 um, up to year 12. 
where when you call yourself a STEM teacher, the expertise now needs to be across four subject disciplines, which is quite a big ask. But we see expertise within our teachers, within science, with our teachers, within technology, within engineering, within mathematics, and bringing those teachers working together. And across all schools and all sectors, and something that Stans was also supporting, is bringing those together so that teachers work. I mean, it's been quite a long time since I spoke to a maths teacher, but with the introduction of STEM, you get to talk to those teachers. I mean, talking to a TAS teacher, why would we? They're just applied science, they're not real science guys. But STEM involves all that, it's all rich, and when we look at STEM, we're not looking at content, we're looking at skill. We're looking at building those skills that are important to STEM. And those skills are what we see in this rank in the New South Wales New South Wales syllabus for the Australian curriculum, which is those cross curricular priorities. It's problem solving, it's critical thinking, it's those skills in literacy and numeracy which will help you go on to be a valid citizen after year twelve or after year eleven from when you choose to continue education. We see those skills in working together and collaboration and the car is working on resources to be able to help teachers do those. So STEM isn't really a subject, it's those really important skills and we call them um, 21st century skills, but I think we're what, 16, 17 years in 21st century now? So let's just call them life skills. Let's call them skills for what students need. The skills of collaboration and problem solving would have helped me two years ago, it would have helped me when I was in school, it would have helped me if I was living in the 1900s. It will help you at all times because they're really important skills that will help you in any part or in any avenue that you choose to go in after you leave school or even avenues that you choose to go in school. So I think in summation when, what I, I want to say is that Stansworth supports the professional learning of all teachers and we work well across all sectors, the Catholics, independent schools that don't belong as well as the department schools as well. And all these providers essentially are providing rich education for their, for their students and that option that we have in New South Wales to provide that is quite rich and it allows a diversity across teaching strategies and a diversity across professional learning as well. Thank you very much. Any quick questions for Dr. Sure. Um, I may be out of date on this, but the last time I remember reading about it, we're facing a potentially pretty bad shortage of teachers in like sort of STEM subjects, including science, um, in New South Wales and in Australia and in New South Wales specifically. And I'm wondering, like, is that still true? And if so, like, what I guess your know, association would have thoughts on what the best way to go about addressing that problem is. I think um, the last um, bit of information I read, and I'm not quite sure about the, the numbers in terms of data, but um, there is a shortage of teachers overall. That also includes maths teachers as well. So um, we'll talk about science, which is um, where I sit. We have a shortage of physics teachers, and Simon knows um, more than enough about that. And there was a move um, 10, 15 years ago to retrain um, teachers to go into physics. So essentially just that, um, upskilling of content, upskilling of how to be able to teach um, what we see within 7 to 10 and what we see within year 11 and 12 physics courses. That still does go on now, I think you still can be retrained, a lot of teachers do go for that because the opportunities are there for jobs. But um, essentially the shortage is across all the subjects. Mathematics sees about, I don't know the hard numbers, but a large proportion, about 70% teaching out of field which means that, so let's just say a large number of teaching out of field and we'll call it qualitative data, shall we? So, a large number of teachers are teaching out of field, which means that if you're, if you're in a school and there are mathematics teachers, the majority of those may not be their subject expertise. So, we have that in science as well. We have um, uh, teachers who are trained in PDHP who teach science. Look, they teach it well, but it's not their area of expertise. And people who teach mathematics are teaching it because the jobs are there but the demand coming in isn't there. I think PDHP is one of the highest graduates that we have as teachers, but the demand for jobs aren't there. And so there is a bit of a disparity. So when it comes to STEM, what we do have is we have a need to upskill teachers across all the areas. So the technology subjects, especially when it comes to engineering, because we see um, engineering more as um, what STEM can do. So science is kind of that content, the, the driver of content. It's those um, concepts that you can really delve with. Mathematics is a language of most of the subjects we talk about and it's a way to be able to show proof and show meaning. Technology is what we use to be able to really um, build our, our projects and build what STEM can be and engineering really is a make around that. What students can build, what can they produce? Because STEM isn't about writing things down on a piece of paper, they're exams, 
they're a bit outdated, but we still use them. They're quite nice um, if you want to waste some time in an exam room. But at the same time, you know, we want students to be working with their hands. We want students to be building things that we do in the real world. Even as teachers, we build things. We make things for our students. We build models. We also write documents as well. All that is part of that build process that we want to see in STEM. So yeah, there, there is a shortage um, and I think that needs to be met. So if an education policy was to look at that, was to dissect the data in terms of where the shortages were, it'd be to provide the best support to be able to get more teachers within those subjects. We do have that within some um, government departments. I believe within the Department of Education, the Teach New South Wales branch looks at providing scholarships for teachers going into STEM who have an interest in STEM to be able to provide them with a scholarship to either retrain or work within schools as well as the pre-graduate training, um, the pre-graduate scholarships that they have where pre-service teachers can apply and essentially their um, degrees paid for so they can go into schools with a training in the subjects that are at demand and that seems to be mathematics and science. Oh, um, what was it? Oh, I have heard this course that says students are turned off by the time they get to high school, it's too late. They're already not into science, not into particularly maths. Do you guys do, like, what's your take on that? The data out there shows that students love science. That has come out recently. Students do love what science is. There's a reason why a lot of um, shows that are science-based take hold because of that interest and curiosity that students, as well as adults, and we see that now as well, that they bring to be able to it's a curiosity that they have where they enjoy what science can be. We know that there's also another um, set of research that shows that students by about year four know what they want to do or have a fair idea and it's hard to kind of sway them. At the same time, conversely or paradoxically, what we also have is we have an issue now with what's happening in the future. 70% of jobs are unknown in the future and we believe they may be in STEM but they are unknown. We talk about automation and all jobs being automated, but essentially the job I may have in the future may not be what I'm thinking of now. So it's quite unclear to a lot of students when they choose subjects in um, year eight for year nine and 10 and choose subjects in year 10 to go into 11 and 12, that may not be what they want to go into because jobs like you know social media advisor are quite new. Jobs like you know Facebook, analyzer is very new and the data coming out of things like that didn't exist 10 years ago. I mean we talk about you know people who used to knock on doors as alarm clocks. When was the last time we used an alarm clock? We've even moved from there so there's a lot of things are changing and jobs are changing so talk about the unknown jobs of the future or the jobs of the future we're not really aware of what they will be. What we do know are the skills in STEM may be able to help students go into any of those jobs that will be formed in the future because they're bringing those important skills of collaboration, problem solving, and critical thinking. So there's, look, there's data out there that shows kids love science, but there may be an issue with um, the engagement factor when it comes from primary school to high school. Primary school teachers are amazing at pedagogy. They do an excellent job, but there's also a fear there, and someone may talk about this, and he's seen that within his work that he does, a fear with teaching science, because science is seen as being really difficult. Science is really hard, guys. Like, you know, there are numbers and big words. So when you take that at a primary level, the really important thing is to support teachers in what they do, but to support them in effective practice. Bringing in a STEM specialist isn't it. I'd, I, st I, I still try and get my mind about what a STEM specialist is, a specialist across four areas. Um, essentially, we're bringing Einstein into our lessons every time, we're just grabbing their information. So, in, there needs to be an effective um, situation in place, or effective strategy in place, and I think that's something that can be discussed further in terms of what will really help teachers be able to teach primary um, science effectively so that when they get to high school, there's still an engagement factor. Their kids come to high school and want to blow things up. Let's do an experiment, let's make a big boom. And look, we do that, but there's only so many explosions you can do. Um, so what so we want to do, that's to yeah, explain them with the love of science. Oh, look, and we have that, and teachers do quite effectively at a high school level as well, but again, there's that need to always provide professional learning and development to be able to provide those strategies and pedagogies for teachers that are contemporary as opposed to traditional. Taking into account that all those strategies, contemporary and traditional, do have its place in any classroom. So kids love science, but we need to help our teachers to and support them in terms of what they're doing within the classroom. Do you think that high school teachers need to be experts or just sufficiently knowledge to get through the syllabus without the kids asking too many tough questions? 
And if you do think they need to be that higher level, how do you stop the, you know, the experts in the field from going off to get another career where they are earning twice as much? I think the careers right now that earn twice as much are careers in data. It's the data specialists and working with numbers and those careers, I think minimum are earning $120,000 if you look at seek.com and just search those. So, and those are the professions that are looking at you know, crunching numbers and analyzing big data. Um, and teachers seem to not be there when it comes to being paid, but that's something that's always being worked on. But look, they do a great job for what it is. Um, teachers need a, a, good prof a good model for professional development, professional learning within schools to always help them be um, at the top of the game when it comes to teaching. Essentially, a teacher's job first and foremost is to teach. As a science teacher, while I have my, um, my areas of expertise, I can teach science across a wide variety because that's what I do as a science teacher. I just take the strategies that I have um, as a teacher, the, the pedagogies that work well, and I can blend in the content. When it comes to being that subject-specific expert, I don't think that's um, a necessarily a requirement for a teacher, because teachers need to first and foremost teach effectively, and content can always come in. And in fact, at this day and age where information is so readily available, when you look at the amount of information that's being geared towards, um, towards children, it's coming from everywhere. The, um, a, a student would be able to look at, or a child these days would be able to look at their own Facebook page and shuffle through more information in one day's posts than a person in the 1920s would have access to in their lifetime. So we have that access for information coming from a wide variety of places, and so students will always access that. So I think being an expert at this point in time seems to be a little bit, a little bit um, redundant, if you will, because we can gain information from everywhere. I think it's a teacher's job to be able to teach that effectively, but be able to access information in proper ways, critically analyze, collaborate, problem solve, and they're the skills that I think are really important. Um, I'm in the process of forming something similar to a STEM collective at UTS, except we're a STEAM collective, we're inclusive of arts. Because if you say, look at Da Vinci, he's an artist, or fireworks, that's chemistry and art, or even cameras, because that's art advancing technology, how do you see art um, being involved in STEM? Every subject in school has its place. When we look at integrating subjects, it's important to see where those subjects really take hold. So as I said previously, making that authentic. So if we talk about um, any concept in science, and I use science to drive my point, I can bring in mathematics at most points because that can drive it, that can, that's the language that we can use. There's technology that we can use to drive what we're doing, to collect data, to use, to present, and engineering can be the make. Art has a place. But at this point, what I question, this is my belief, not the belief of Stan's, but I'd like to say that first and foremost, is that if you're trying to integrate a lot of subjects, we just call that integrated curriculum. And, but again, when you blend things in, it needs to have a place, needs to have an authentic purpose. And art is everywhere. It's one of those very general things where it, it helps um, make, the, it, it, it visualizes a lot of things, but there are processes in art and skills in art that are quite important. So if we're bringing in those skills that students can use, then that can be quite rich. But again, same as STEM, when you're bringing that in, it's not about those four subjects or areas at all times, it's about the ones that fit. But talk about the skill, not the content, because the content can always be taken, the content can always be grabbed from anywhere. It's about how the skills transfer to students learning and what they can do with that. So is that like how an engineer works with an architect? All comes in, comes in quite authentically. When I looked at it, if we have um, opportunities in classes to be able to look into a microscope, well that's science and technology that really works really well together. It's going to be, I can bring the mathematics by looking at um, diagrams and looking at scale and ratio and that can be quite important. If I then transfer that image that I'm seeing and say, well, let's replicate that as an artwork, what I'm doing is making that quite tokenistic by just using art as a medium as opposed to the skills required in art, which can be reading, interpreting, and developing to something that actually has a purpose. So I think that's what needs to be taken into account. Now, I use the word authentic because students' learning has to be authentic because if they relate to it, they care about it and it means something for them. It's when we say, hey, let's learn this, and they go, I don't know what you're saying or where that's coming from. So Why do we need to do this? Authentic <laughs> learning, exactly. How does it relate to their lives? Yeah. Um, having said that about the STEM and art, that's been the cell. That's been done the other way around, where a cell has been analysed by an artist who's also studied the molecular structure, and he's then been able to create a 3D model of the cell that currently isn't able to be taken 
like an accurate representation that isn't able to be taken with current technology. It, so that's art leading into... If there's an authentic purpose, yeah. then it makes sense. Yeah. And it's always it's about that authentic purpose and that relation to student learning. Yeah. Thanks again to... Sorry, the was there the one in the back? Oh, sorry. sorry, I didn't say... Go. Uh, one good, good question. Now, there have been a couple of things in pop culture in the past few years that science teachers have really noticed as being the main things driving interest in science. <laughs> there, I think when it comes to when it comes to teaching, and we've done a, I think some and both have done when we've been teaching as well. You use contemporary um, issues and you use things out there in the media to be able to really bring some relation. Whether that be things like Breaking Bad, whether it be the Big Bang Theory, whether it be the um, I freaking love science all those all those things out there allow us to be able to um, bring in things that our students can relate with and we can bring those very easily into the classroom and that, that even includes um, the introduction I, I don't know when you guys remember when YouTube was a kid but now when with the the collection of YouTube videos that we have a lot of that tends to drive what um, some lessons are all about because students will bring those to the classroom and say well let's do this and I think that's everything in the media whether it be pop culture whether it be the media itself we bring those into the classroom to make it relational, but what we do as teachers is we make that authentic and we really blend those skills of working scientifically and if you want to use the STEM skills, those STEM skills as well, to make that authentic and mean something for them. Because students have to take that back and they've got to, it has to make sense. I wouldn't use Breaking Bad as one of, <laughs> as a thing, um, but when we do make copper sulfate crystals, t kids do tend to get the wrong. Um, message sometimes that we are making things we shouldn't be. But again, we it, it's a great opportunity for us to talk about misconceptions and talk about you know how how science is perceived in the media and how we as scientists and we as science communicators and educators are able to show that to our students. I've got a question. By all means. Uh, with the new syllabus, we've found out um, the last few days that the math syllabus is going to be delayed, the implementation, because it's not ready. Amongst English teachers, there's conversation about why can't we have that too? Because ours isn't ready either. So what kind of shape is the science syllabus in and how do teachers, um, how are teachers feeling about it? I'm actually preempt Simon with this one and ask him to kind of join me in talking about this because um, look, the new science syllabus has have, um, the, it's been flipped on its head. So we brought in um, less content, but we brought in some contemporary content. So physics back in the day, and Simon would know this as well, and I would know when we taught it, we were teaching the cathode ray tube. And I think we're teaching it back in, what, 2011. So the cathode ray tube, I don't think, existed for quite a while. I remember having it as a kid, but again, it, it, a lot of the old syllabus kept a lot of the traditional things, including the fax machine. And I would question anyone sending me a fax these days, because my fax machine doesn't exactly work, because it's 2017 now. Um, so. A lot of great contemporary issues are brought in across all the subjects. Um, science has been written very well where it's based around inquiry questions. So it's again that, that change in pedagogy, that inquiry, which is all what science is about. It's about asking questions. It's about discovering for yourself and teachers can now drive that within their students. Um, Simon, do you see it being Look, I, I think science teachers are just champing at the bit to get started because it's been mm -hmm. delayed. So we've, it's been the other way around. It's like it's been delayed and delayed. So we just want to get started. Now we've got it. You know, for better or for worse, we've got something we just want to get mm. started. My wife's an English teacher, so I've been hearing a lot about the English um, syllabus. But I, I believe all the text came out, which was one of the biggest concerns there. Maths has been a lot more political, and there have been some real heavyweights who've come in quite late and been allowed to come into the conversation, better or for worse. So in terms of English being allowed in, you know, let's say the same dispensation, I don't think... In my understanding from conversations with people in Nessa and in the universities and the lobby groups, that um, the, the, the delay for maths has always been on the cards okay. because like, some big hitters came out quite late in the piece, quite vocally, and it's become quite English, political. English hasn't had the same advocacy pushing against it. What, what I do know, because my wife's on the English Teachers Association's yes. Facebook group, yes, yes, I'm and here. <laughs> so it's interesting they've been smashing Nessa, so I believe, mm. whereas... Sorry, the authority. The, the authority, whereas I believe um, Stanisla have been very supportive because, mm. forget, forgive me if I'm talking out of turn here, Vache, but 
We just want to get on with it. Yeah. Okay, so and science teachers have been quite supportive of the new syllabus, but it's brought it back to what um, the consultation feedback has shown that teachers have said, mm -hmm. which is bring back the science, bring back what we do as teachers, and teachers have been really um, supportive of that. So when we have a syllabus and we've got all these, um, we've kind of had a revamp of all the, all the subjects, and we've got this new subject called Investigating Science, which is this general methods-based course that we can bring in and we can attract any student. They can, and they can all take it. They can all take it with their subjects to enhance what they're doing it's looking quite nice and with the proposed science extension on the cards there's a lot of good things looking for science so I think we've been quite lucky that um, the the authority has supported us and Nessa has supported that as well as have all the people on those committees as well as have all the organizations stands up being one of them as well it's been a really good syllabus we've got this it's I don't know, can you tell I'm excited about it? It's just, it's, 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 got, it's got really good drivers in those and a lot of teachers are looking at it going, yes, I can do this. It's re re reinvigorating programming, it's reinvigorating how teachers are looking at the 11 and 12 courses and how they, how they structure those because we've got this rigor in now in physics and chemistry that we haven't really had before for about 18 years. So we want to bring that in so all of a sudden we get to, in, Here's, here's a thought, we're going to excite kids with mathematics <laughs> and we can't wait because it, it's about what science is. So um, all teachers have been supportive and it's been quite a nice ride. Mm, good. But don't get me started about the proposed new primary syllabus. So actually I might, oh, okay. I might get started <laughs> on that because it's... Uh, I'll, I'll end it there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks too much. <laughs> I invite you to get started straight away. Oh, thanks. Um, well, uh, j j just as a quick introduction, and uh, thanks for that earlier as well, Tom, um, and great being here. Um, I was a high school physics teacher for 15 years um, in the UK and here in Sydney. Uh, then I worked um, as an e-learning advisor for a system of schools for about six and a half years, and that was very much about integrating technology in all subjects. And in high schools at first, and then it was K to 12. Uh, so yeah, across the curriculum, particularly with the use of say things like laptops, but um, you know online technologies, and then uh, just over two years ago, I stepped out on my own to, f to form Crooked Science as a STEM consultancy. Um, and in my work, I work with primary schools around what was the new syllabus just over two years ago. Um, science is not the usual area of confidence in primary teachers. Um, in fact, it's identified as a high area of anxiety for them. Um, but what we need to do is, just, as Vache was saying before, is we need to support them. They don't need to be experts in the field, but they, they need to be more experts and more familiar with the skills, and they need to see how it's achievable. And they need a lot of support in that regard. And there isn't a lot of support. So I shouldn't be in a job. I shouldn't be able to have my own private consultancy. But the department slashed all the regions a few years ago. Um, the Catholic system, they, they've got, they're struggling with funding. Um, independents are independent by definition. Um, so I have plenty of work supporting primary schools with the current syllabus as it is. I also do a lot of work with high schools around, and sorry, that's in the classroom with the kids and the teachers, so like exciting the kids and modeling best practice. Uh, for the teachers, but then also professional development for the teachers. I also do a lot of work with high schools around HSC physics, which is my background. Um, again, I do some face-to-face -face with the students, leveraging a lot of technology with kind of like flips learning and online videos, e-portfolios, but then face-to-face -face, um, and experiments and the like, and then also a lot of professional developments. And with the new syllabuses, particularly with the physics, particularly with, say, content, as Vachi was saying, thermodynamics coming out and there's also some new waves and new electric circuits, and that's just year 11. That's not even the year 12 stuff. Um, you could have a, an experienced teacher who's been teaching for 16 years and has never taught thermodynamics because that was pre-2001, um, and it might not have never been in their education. So there's a whole load of training that needs to happen for these new syllabuses, and there's no support. Okay, so when the K-10 syllabuses came out, there was money that came federally and statewide for schools and systems and all the rest of it. But um, there's a lot less happening in terms of like teachers being able to have, they tend to be getting support for writing programs, which is nice and has to be there in scope and sequences. But what about actually learning thermodynamics in the first place? What about learning how to do the experiments? 
the pedagogy, the health and safety, uh, all of those things. There's, there's very little going on. So Stanners were uh, organizing these conferences, as Vachia was saying, and the physics one's coming up soon, and all the other subjects as well. But um, there needs to be a lot of support. So I'm trying to, you know, I'm only one person, and trying to fill in a little bit of that. And also getting out to regional remote schools, um, because they're isolated. And uh, the, they can, you know, there's, very less, there's even less support that they can get. Um, I've just finished my PhD in uh, physics education research um, in Sydney, um, in the same group that um, Tom works in as well, and is studying in. And that was looking at the use of technology in the classroom. Um, I've done a little bit of work with Border Studies, then became BOSTES, then NESA Authority around technologies, and I'm a member of Stan as well, and I've paid my fees. <laughs> so, uh, okay. In terms of my agenda and talking to you guys and the brief I got from Tom, what I want to do, because he asked, us, uh, or he asked uh, me to um, have a look at your policy and to feedback. So I've got some feedback on your policy, so if you don't mind me talking about that, um, and then, if you like, a couple of my own drums to bang at the end, if that's okay. And sorry, um, I haven't been like SMSing during this evening. I've got my notes here and I was just checking that they were working before. Um, so the reform of funding for the schools, your number one, going the full Gonski, personally, absolutely fantastic. And I think it's really important to understand that Gonski is sector agnostic. So where there are disadvantaged schools that are government or Catholic or independent, if they are disadvantaged, they get the support that they need. Similarly, schools that are very, very advantaged, whatever flavor, you know, require less funding, so to speak. So it's targeted funding based on needs. Um, your national curriculum policy. Now, I don't know if that's piggybacking on what you think is currently there or you're going to write a new national curriculum, but for those of you who don't realize, there is an Australian curriculum out there. We don't do that in New South Wales because New South Wales think they're better than everyone else. Okay, so I can say these things because I don't have an employer anymore. It's, 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 it's so liberating. Um, and that's a real problem because if you're a teacher in a New South Wales school, and I'll take the example of primary teachers, and then there's all these resources that are put out you know, for the Australian curriculum, some of them don't apply. If you follow just Australian curriculum resources, like let's say Primary Connections, you won't even be Border Studies compliant. You wouldn't be New South Wales compliant. Okay, so that's a pain in the backside when you're a teacher teaching outside of your specialism. You already lack confidence in the subject. So um, if you are going to sort out a national curriculum, you either have to force all states to do it, or you get rid of bodies like Nessa, or you get rid of the states. Coming from the UK, I'm still, per I'm, I'm, I'm still perplexed by railway gauges and things. So, um, <clears throat> but you need to understand it's not a national curriculum in terms of how your policy is shaped up. Different people are doing different things. So, look, some things in New South Wales are better, but it's different to everyone else. It's not national. Um, your extension school, I thought was quite an interesting idea. Um, I'm curious as to who would run it because um, there's a shortage of, say, science teachers, but at the same time, if you follow an OOSH and out-of-hours, out-of-school hours kind of approach, um, you wouldn't necessarily have to have trained people, so they could just be <laughs> people with special interests <laughs> uh, in science who could be leading it and, you know, they wouldn't be paid like a teacher's rate and teachers wouldn't want to be staying back till, you know, six at night um, as glorified daycare. But... I think that's quite an interesting thing and you know there's already people who are doing music and art and languages and stuff in like as after school there are people doing science in after school but it's it's, it's all localized so if you had like a bigger thing I think that could be quite good um, it could be a nice little learner for you know kind of postgrads or undergrads there's some consultants that I know some <laughs> I might charge a little bit more. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, okay, increasing efficiency and reducing waste in education by not reinventing the wheel in every separate school and like sharing resources and all that. Right. So I think that's absolutely fantastic. That does happen in, say, some schools already and clusters of schools and systems of schools. I think, it's, I think authorship is really important that we identify the authorship. 
but then like disseminating those resources is absolutely fantastic. That has been going on already with things like um, TES, Times Education Supplements Australia, but I think this year they've just started charging, which is what happened in the UK. You had teachers sharing all their resources for free. <laughs> and then I think if you perhaps submit resources, you have free access to all the others. But um, look, I would say, yeah, that, that, that's a, a really, really good initiative. Um, and don't get caught up in all the rubbish in terms of like, how some of them are like they're only available to say one sector or they're only available to one state which has happened historically with things like say Scootle and things which is now national but you have to remember your login and this that and the other just have it just open to the world you know um, seriously okay improving staffing to disadvantaged schools okay great absolutely but there, there's a few things here if we're talking seriously disadvantaged schools we're not just talking kind of like, you know, poor suburbs in big cities. We're talking remote indigenous schools. If you're talking about the most disadvantaged, like obscene when you compare against other, you know, um, Western um, societies. I've worked in a remote school in the Kimberley, okay, two hours down a red dirt road um, north of Broome. Um, great things going on in that school and some not so great things going down there. They have Kimberley calling, they have an incentive scheme, people get more money, and then if they stay longer, they get a bonus and this, that, and the other. Sometimes you attract really good teachers who want to be there for the right reasons, and sometimes you attract people who are just cashing in. And you are in a community, but yet you're not in a community because all the white teachers are just coming through for one year, two years, maybe three years if you're lucky and they come and go. Um, and then you've got a whole community with all the social issues that are there. Like they literally live in one part of town and the teachers live in another part of town. So if you're going to be really helping the most disadvantaged, there's a whole load of bigger issues that are beyond education, like social issues, Australian social issues and inequities that need to be addressed. So I think it's fantastic that you have it in there, but there's a few things to think about just in terms of what kinds of incentives that you do. In terms of staffing though as well, um, banging some of my, my personal drums, it's the staffing of science teachers. You asked the question before in terms of the shortage. 50% of, of physics teachers are retiring in the next 10 to 15 years. I think there's eight studying to be physics teachers at Sydney Uni and the independent schools get to try before they buy. 20% of physics teachers three years ago were teaching outside of subjects. I think it was actually 42% for maths, but it was a lot. Um, so it's, it's even worse for maths. Um, they are mostly PE teachers, as Vachia was saying, because there's too many PE teachers and not enough science teachers or maths teachers. We need to be sorting out this staffing issue. Now, one of the issues I had... One of the issues I have with the new physics syllabus, I don't have any issues with the content, just want to get on with it. It's been mooted because of the increased rigour, the numbers are going to fall across the state from 9,000 to 7,000. Yet at the same time, they're going to attract the brightest kids from the humani humanities to um, come back to the sciences because it's proper science now. It's not like woolly like it was. Now, if you're having a drop of, say, 2,000, yet you're attracting back the best kids, I don't see all the selective schools losing their four or five physics classes. If anything, they might gain numbers. Where are those numbers being lost from? They're being lost from rural, remote and low SES schools. Now, if those schools don't have the numbers, they can't run physics. If you can't run physics, aspirational parents won't send your kids to those schools and you get residualization. Now, it was glibly said to me that, well, that will address the physics teacher shortage. Well, that's just immoral. We don't want to only teach physics in some schools because we only have so many teachers. I work in some schools, some more affluent schools, who have four, five, six physics teachers. I work with some schools who have no physics teachers. Now, that's wrong. So we need to be making sure that every school does have a trained teacher 
a high school to teach um, within those areas, or mechanisms are put into place. And it's also been glibly pointed out to me that, you know, maybe I can profit from this and I can just do lots of online teaching and teach all these schools. Well, I don't want to profit from inequity that's actually being socially engineered here, or we're putting our head in the sand and allowing it to happen. So I think there needs to be some really proactive um, kind of like policy and initiatives to address the shortage of teaching and in physics and in chemistry. And um, they're the two main ones within the sciences. Um, moving down, um, computing, programming in school. Okay. First of all, after the funding, I think that's your second longest policy statement. That rings alarm bells to me. I'm asking why. And I'm saying that because the new proposed primary syllabus, we've got a syllabus that's just over two years old. They, they want to bring a new one out. You've got until the 5th of May, so next week, to actually comment on this. You can get it on the Nessa website to comment on what you think of it at the moment. And then it closes. It's been totally hijacked by the technologies lobby groups, the computing teachers. Now, as someone who was an e-learning advisor, any subjects can use technology. It doesn't just have to be just particularly digital technologies. It doesn't have to be something unique in its own right, in my opinion. Um, STEM, a lot of people say, oh, we've got a STEM school because we run programming. Oh, programming is great. It's one tiny, tiny aspect of STEM. That does not make you a STEM school. That's not what STEM club is. Um, so I'm just thinking in terms of initial message, why is the programming so long in your thing? Um, and if, you, if it is going to become mandatory in schools, in place of what? Something has to give. There's only so many hours in the day. There's recommendations currently in, in New South Wales and in other states about what they are. What's it going to give, you know, what's going to go instead? But, <laughs> okay, um, <laughs> they probably want more than 45 minutes. Um, but sorry, the flip side to that is ACARA, who are the national body who wrote the Australian curriculum that we don't do in New South Wales, have released digital technologies as a separate thing that looks at programming and scratch and all the things that you have in there. They have it as separate. So you will do that separately in South Australia and you'll do that separately in the Northern Territory and all the rest of it. In New South Wales, they're shoving it into science. So it's science and technology. Okay, and the other technology, the engineering side of things has been taken out and it's all digital technologies in primary. Um, so they're, they're not even dedicating the amount of time to it there um, and doing it differently to everyone else. So there's a few things to think about there. Also, in terms of your recommendation about how to get teachers up to speed with digital technologies and you're saying, you know, make a few videos to show them what to do. And I don't mean this in a patronizing sense. I think we need some adult learning principles in your policy. Because if you're going to get primary teachers who've only just got to grips with a science syllabus, suddenly teaching, you know, programming and stuff. Um, you know, some people maybe at the end of their careers, um, some technophobes, this, that and the other. Um, yeah, I think it needs to be more than just videos, but more than just videos in terms of professional developments, that costs money. So there's things to think about there. Okay, mandatory teaching ethics in school. The first part of what you say of that, fantastic, love it. The second part, which is as, like a big footnote, you got, but by the way, with reference to, you know, religion in schools, don't have it as a big footnote. If you want to be explicit about what you're saying in terms of funding of religious schools, name it in your policy. But I would, and I don't want to be, I'm here to talk about science, I don't want to be here to talk about um, religion personally. Um, but I would say do that with a big word of warning in terms of, if we think about Catholic systemic schools, that's 20% of kids. If you're not funding those schools, they don't run. They, they exist on 80% funding from federal. A teeny tiny bit from state, but 80% 80, 80 from federal. If they're not funded, they don't exist. Where do those kids go? And if you want some case law, look at the Goldman strike from the 60s. Um, so you don't want to throw out the baby with the bathwater in all of this. So I'd just be, and also if you're talking about voting blocks as well, 
I can, I'm privy to what the Catholic schools did when the Greens came out and said that they would get rid of all Catholic schools. There was a serious, serious initiative before the last election amongst all Catholic schools to all parents, don't vote Green because you get rid of the schools. So you're running the risk of losing that voting block. Now maybe you don't want to attract those people, but there's also an ethnic aspect here. Okay, you know, we can all be here and nice, educated, middle class and all the rest of it. But when you're talking um, Filipino, um, Goan Indian, um, Maronite Lebanese, Melkitan, Chaldean and uh, other Eastern Rites, Iraqi, um, Iranian, um, Syrian and all the rest of it, you're actually talking about... A some people have identities and might identify with certain schools that are religious. And, and sorry, I'm, I'm just talking in the kind of like Catholic sense. I mean, obviously there's Islamic and Jewish and all the rest of it. But, yeah, I'd think carefully about that one. But if you're going to name it, name it. Don't kind of like sneak it in. Uh, sex and relationships education, fantastic. Mandatory primary and science STEM classes. Again, in place of what? Something's got to give if you're going to do that. Taught by whom? when we've already got a shortage. And specialty teachers, and I've, I mean, I've been friends with Vache for a long time, but we spoke about a little bit of this beforehand. I found that I was, I've got a, a new ally in one of my little drums, which is the specialty teachers. Now, Ian Chubbers, um, you know, when he was the, um, um, what was his title? A chief scientist. He was saying, and like it was in all the press and the conversation and everything, you know, we have specialty primary science teachers. Yeah, great idea. Where are you gonna get them from? And how are you gonna train them? If you're in a big primary school, you need at least two. So practically speaking, I just don't think it's practical. And the other thing as well is, working, you know, in a lot of, I was in a primary school today, working in primary schools on a very regular basis. If you suddenly make a special, specialty teacher, as they do with PE and art at the moment, all the rest of the teachers think, I don't have to do that. And what you're doing is you're de-skilling the majority of teachers. I actually see from a practical point of view, but also perhaps from a almost moral point of view, it's the responsibility of all teachers in primary school to teach science and technology, which means that the teacher training colleges need to address that because they're not. And the school systems need to address it for all the incumbents because there's you know, a lack of self-efficacy and then you know, in a lot of cases a lack, a lack of efficacy in that regard. So. Um, yeah, I'm, I would think hard, long and hard about that one, or, or how that's going to look. Um, and your vocational ed, you know, fantastic, and your university funding, fantastic. So in terms of my personal drums, um, I've said about the physics teachers shortage, I've said about specialty primary teachers. Um, I want to just th throw a cat amongst the pigeons a little bit here. I'll be interested to know on what the science party's opinion is of selective schools because selective schools whilst advantaging all those students that go there and there's been a lot of research uh, sorry there's a something in the SMH recently in terms of the uh, socio-economic um, average of people in um, selective schools so you're advantaging the most advantaged people anyway but it's the flip side, it's the residualisation. When you have that special school there, what happens to the school next door? They're just picking up the dregs. So there's a whole load of educational research there around residualisation. You look in the inner west, I live in the inner west. I think 13 of the government schools, of 11 of the 13 government schools are actually specialist, sorry, are selective in some way or another. Be full selective, or they've got selective streams, or they're selective arts, or selective creative arts, and things like that. Then you've got your comprehensive schools, like Marrickville High. I think they've got 40 empty classrooms. Okay, you go to Stanmore Public, just down the road from Marrickville High. Okay, you've got some parents, you know, with all the best morals and things in, in the world, and what they want for their kids, and how they think everything should be equitable, but they're also quite affluent. Are they going to send them, their kids to the school, the comprehensive school, when it's not comprehensive 
It's just the dregs, it's the leftovers. Uh, I would say no, because that's why there's so many empty classrooms. So, it's an interesting thing. The Catholics have never had selective schools, but they're just about to bring it out. Um, I'm just throwing that in as a hand grenade, um, you know, <laughs> just to stir the pots. And I'm also curious, because you also said about standardised testing in there, um, curious about your standpoints on things like NAPLAN. And more to the point, how it's used. From a personal point of view, I, don't have a, I really don't have a problem with my child being tested and then tested a couple of years later and I see if they've improved or not how they should have. That's personal between me and my child and their teacher. But to then to be compared across a cohort and between schools and named and shamed in the SMH and this, that and the other, that's an, that's an abuse of it. And to consider it a prerequisite for getting your HSC. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry. There's that. There's that as aspect as well. So I was asking about something else. You can actually use it from a research point of view as as a predictor of future performance, which I think is not a bad thing. But that that's done within the privacy and ethics of research. But yeah, sorry. I, yeah, I totally take the, the point there. The current um, prerequisite, as you call it, is just a literacy and numeracy. Um, yeah. It's a thing, but it essentially it just uh, gives a minimum literacy and numeracy requirement to be able to attain HSC. But it doesn't mean that you won't attain it if you don't get it. You still have five years after completing that you see to be able to attain that standard, which as itself is a, a working standard that would allow any student to go out into the workforce and bring those literacy and numeracy skills and use them effectively. And we are talking about things such as being able to, you know, work out change for money, being able to read um, a bus map in terms of scales, things like that. So it's, it, it's, it's there because of um, the data that's been um, brought in because of the literacy and numeracy rates and how we compare to other countries, but at this point, schools are seeing how it will fit within what they're doing. So it, it's an interesting time in schools. I've marked that yeah. And uh, what, one more hand grenade to throw out there <laughs> uh, is the idea of. Um, grenade launcher. Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, there's, w within, say, um, government schools, some of the more traditional ones allowed to essentially operate as independent schools and as GPS schools. And yet the other ones down the roads don't have those same privileges. So I'm just causing trouble. <laughs> so. Thanks for coming.